So fear, of course, gets in the way. But I have to remind people that in many ways, and psychologists will tell you that fear and excitement are the exact same emotion. It depends on how you are looking at something. Hi everyone, Drew Prote here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. Today, we're talking with award-winning journalist, speaker, and coach, Antonio Neves, about getting unstuck, how to get out of a funk. Have you ever been in a funk in your life? I know I have. Well, we'll be talking today with Antonio about why we get into funk and most importantly, how to get out of it. I think you're gonna love this interview with someone who's a close and dear friend of mine. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast, where we dive deep into the topics of neuroplasticity, epigenetics, mindfulness, functional medicine, and mindset, all with the goal of helping you understand how your brain is not broken. I'm your host, Drew Perlman, and each week, my team and I bring on a new guest who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and most importantly, live more. This week's guest is my good friend, Antonio Neves. Antonio Neves is a nationally recognized leadership speaker, author, and award-winning journalist. His worldwide audience have included Google, Starwood Hotels, and Resorts Worldwide, Stanford University, and many, many more. Antonio is the author of three books, and his next book will be published by Penguin Random House on January 2021. On his podcast, which I was just on, and many of you heard because we re-aired the episode here on the Broken Brain Podcast, on his podcast, The Best Thing, Antonio talks to people about the best thing that's happened to them that would rarely appear on a resume, bio, or come up in conversation. It's unexpected. For over 10 years, Antonio worked as a correspondent in television industry in New York City with top networks, including NBC, PBS, and BET Networks. Antonio, welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, man. I've been a listener for so long. It is an honor to be on with you. Wow, dude, for real. You know, sometimes I do these intros and I'm like, Oh, I'm interviewing my friend. And I always say my friend, my dear friend, my that. And somebody messaged me on Instagram. They're like, dude, why is everybody your dear friend on your (laughs) podcast? And I want to just say that in this case, you actually are my dear friend. We're part of a men's group together. We've spent a lot of time catching up, supporting each other in in each other's goals, dreams, businesses, life, being there for each other. So I'm proud and for the, that individual who uh, sent in the feedback, this is actually my best friend. Not that other people aren't. And uh, it's great to have you here. Yeah. I, I love the dear friend. Call me there all day. You know, I'm, I saw something was missing uh, when I was saying, um, you know, you were a correspondent in television industry. We talked about NBC, PBS, BET. Why'd you leave off uh, Nickelodeon, brother? That's funny. Nickelodeon, that's what people always seem to find when they Google my name. Uh, For your listeners, I spent a few years, my first gig in television after moving to New York City with the cliche story of arriving with $800 in my bank account and barely knowing anyone was breaking in with Nickelodeon. And I co-hosted a show on there for a few years called You Pick Live. I had long dreadlocks and uh, I was just a whole other dude. And the truth is, For a long time, Drew, I I led a lot with Nickelodeon. I had a a successful career there, kids, their parents, everybody knew who I was. But all these years later, that was 2002 to 2004. That just seems like another lifetime ago. It seems like such an earlier chapter. It's it's really past tense. So I don't put it out there too much. But I tell you, after an an event when I'm speaking, people always come up with YouTube and like, hey, man, is this you? I'm like, yes, it is. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I think that embodies one of the themes that we're going to be talking about today, which is that I always remember my dad used to say, like, the lives, the amount of lives that you and I are living in this modern day generation, you know, um, in our 30s and 40s, we are living the equivalent of like five, sometimes six, seven, eight lifetimes compared to the lifetimes of our ancestors. So we go through a lot of different hats and situations and circumstances. We don't have the same profession and live in the same area for our entire life. And with that transition can come a lot of different ups and downs and finding out who we are. And most importantly, getting ourselves out of a funk, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Before we jump into those things, just tell us a little about Antonio's lives growing up. Where'd you grow up? And uh, you know, what kind of kid were you? 
Yeah, I grew up in in small town Michigan, not super far away from a NASCAR speedway. Uh, my upbringing, I guess you would say, was a little bit untraditional. You know, growing up, man, I've dealt with a, a decent amount of instability. But when you're a kid, it's pretty much all that you know. I'm from a community, and a nice community, but frankly, a community where not a lot of people leave. People tend to stay, or if they do leave, they always come back. And I always knew from a young age that there was something else out there and I wanted to explore and I wanted to see what was out there. And I was fortunate enough to be the first in my family, you know, to be a first generation college student, to go away, to get my education. And that opened a lot of doors for me to not just leave the Midwest, because there was a time in my life growing up, Drew, that I thought if I made it to Detroit, if I made it to Chicago, that was it. And I can still remember when I had an internship at Walt Disney World down in Orlando, Florida, When my eyes were just open, I was like, oh, there are people that live other places. There are jobs and careers. I can do this thing called studying abroad. And my eyes were just open truly for the very first time. So at my heart, man, I've always been an adventurer. I've always been an encourager. I've always been an athlete. And I've been willing kind of to go my own way. Sometimes that works out. Sometimes it goes to your your detriment. Uh, but Michigan is a, is a foundation and upbringing I wouldn't take away. It gave me some really strong Midwest values with my father and mother being blue collar people. My dad worked in factories his whole life. My mother was an administrative assistant for the same company for over 30 years. So I learned a lot about work ethic and being willing to to get your hands dirty. I love it. Tell us about, you know, you said you were the first kid in your family to make it to college. And that's a monumental thing. Uh, what was the choice to study and uh, how did you decide to go down a path that eventually took you into journalism? When I showed up at Western Michigan University, Drew, I just knew I wanted to be in college. I didn't know anything about majors. I didn't know about different things you could pursue. As you mentioned in your introduction, I went on to work in broadcast journalism and, and television for over 10 years in New York City. I didn't know I could study journalism. I didn't know I could study these things. So those first couple of years for me, when they call it general education, it literally was general education because I was trying out a little bit of everything and learning on the fly. The good news is I didn't have any pressure from my parents to, you got to be a doctor, you got to be a lawyer, you got to pursue this because they were just happy that I was getting my education. I was fortunate enough at one point I took a entry-level kind of business class. And I learned about this thing called marketing. And I ended up falling love in love with that subject and had some good mentors at the business college at Western Michigan University and ended up majoring in marketing, which I think ended up being a great choice because I learned so much about a variety of things. And it just opened the doors uh, to so many different things in my life. But I, I was a novice on that campus. I, I really didn't even know I could go to college outside of the state. And even if, if that was an opportunity, I knew we couldn't afford it. So college was, again, one of those big growing periods when you're like, wow, there is more out there. You know, you're a science, you've put out a couple books uh, on yourself that you put out that you've independently published. You are signed with Penguin. We just talked about that a little earlier. We'll talk about the book that's coming out in the future. How do you go from somebody who's the first in their family to get into college, just like, just ecstatic to be there, like thriving, you know, really trying to make that the best out of your education. Then eventually in broadcast journalism, journalism, what are the first seeds of personal development and self-development? You know, you have a podcast now, you're, you're about to be a published author through like a traditional publisher. You're a speaker, you're speaking on stages at different places. Where did the first wafts and elements of self-development come in your life? I can remember the day when that first happened in my life. I was in sixth grade. And when I was in sixth grade, Drew, I was going through a really challenging time in life. You know, Between my mom and dad are a total of six different divorces. Before I graduated from high school, I moved over 15 different times in my small hometown. And there's a brief spell of my life, even living in a, in a shelter for battered and abused women and children. So there was a lot of instability going on. And in sixth grade, when I think I was going to turn that proverbial wrong corner, my sixth grade teacher showed up for me in a way that changed my life for the better. And she ended up casting me as the lead in the sixth grade production of The Nutcracker. 
Now, that may seem innocent enough, but Drew, that was the first time in my life where I felt like someone truly believed in me. And that caused me to, in turn, believe in myself. I think that's probably one of the main reasons why I do the work that I do today. And that was Mrs. Hirschman. And and thank God for her believing in me and, and empowering me in that moment, because I think I would have turned a wrong corner. And then what I noticed, Drew, is that throughout my life, there are a lot of quote unquote Miss Hirschmans that showed up for me. They got me to believe in myself, to get me to see things that at the time I couldn't see. Over years, those were track and field coaches when I was in high school and I went on to run track and field in college as well. And I had a coach in college that did those same things for me. I had mentors in college that did the exact same thing. And I've been fortunate, even when I moved to New York City with just $800 in my bank account, knew just one person. Somehow, I've always been able to latch on to mentors that wanted to support me, that believed in me when I needed it most. And I feel like that's my duty today, that at the end of the day, when I do my work as a coach, when I'm on a stage, stage, whether I'm speaking to 5,000 people or 40 people, that's what I'm really trying to get people to do is to believe in themselves, to remember that they have a say in this. And these people believe in me, that it upped up, it upped my confidence. Uh, it gave me the courage to do some things that I otherwise probably wouldn't have done. But it truly goes back to sixth grade and Mrs. Hirschman and the power of a teacher uh, to really instill confidence in, in a young person. So let's pivot here into the topic that we wanted to cover here, and then we'll come back to your story. Um, you know, when we were talking about what do we want to talk about today and what kind of conversation do we want to offer? Cause there's such a breadth of topics we could do. I was telling you that there's this theme that you regularly help out people who are sort of stuck in their career, who are looking to figure out what's next, that they feel like the best is behind them. And I was chatting with you that I said, you know, even if people, whether they're young, whether they're older, I think everybody can resonate with getting stuck in a funk and the feeling of what it means. And for whatever reason, it seems now, especially in quarantine time and lockdown time period, I think a lot of people are realizing that they've been in a funk and they might've even been in a funk way before this whole pandemic went down. You know, knock on wood, we hope everybody's okay. We wish for their family. I feel for everybody who's, you know, lost their, you know, job and other situations that are out there. And in addition to that, whether people have been directly affected or not affected, there's this whole layer of people who are just dealing with this feeling of being stuck and in a funk. I'd love your general thoughts and commentary on why you think that's happening today. The reason why it's happening today, let's be clear, man. We've been on a treadmill for a really long time. A lot of decisions that we have made really aren't decisions that we've made. If you live in the States and you're trying to follow the American dream, you know, they tell you to go get a good education and they tell you to get a good job and they tell you to get married and buy a home and do these things, which on the paper, all those all of those are really good positive things. However, sometimes we realize we get to that point in life when we realize we felt a little bit out of control in the decisions that we've made and we're doing things that we truly don't want to do. Now, the irony of this, Drew, is that on paper, everything could look perfect. Everything could look right. We got the job. We got the decent income. We look good on Instagram and LinkedIn. We have the home with the white picket fence. Yes, something is missing internally. And I'm a great example of that, Drew. Uh, The genesis of my next book, it really starts with me back in 2016 when on paper, everything looked great. Married, uh, father to uh, twins, uh, a successful career. On paper, everything looked good, but I was dying inside because there were some things that weren't happening in my life that made me feel, frankly, dull. And for people listening to this, if they're curious, hey, they're talking about a funk, what does it look like to be in a funk? I I just want to share a couple of examples of what it can feel like or look like to be in a funk. And we can start, you mentioned the career side of things. So on the career side of things, being in a funk can look like you used to do great work, but at some point you transition to doing good enough work. It can look like at some point you really wanted that promotion. You really wanted that raise. But now, the more you think about it, getting that promotion, that more responsibility, it feels more like a burden than something that's positive. 
Um, it also can look like there was a time when you would spend time building relationships with your colleagues, going out to happy hour or to lunches. And now it's got to the point where you've turned down their overtures and their invitations so much that they're no longer asking you to go out. You know, on the personal side of things, what does it look like to be in a funk? Um, this is something you've talked about a lot on your podcast, Drew, is you know, when we've retreated from our friends, when we've retreated from our community, you may be in a funk. If you no longer have hobbies and you're doing those things that bring you joy or you're regularly, quote unquote, finishing things, you can be in a funk. And last two things that I'll share relating to a funk is you have nothing to look forward to. You know, a lot of people, you know, we thrive on having something to look forward to, that event, that vacation, you name it, those dinner plans with the, the friends, but you no longer are doing those. And lastly, when it comes to, you know, our, am I in a funk? A lot of folks have stopped learning. Again, education has been such a big component of our lives. And at some point, we, we, we've stopped learning. We've stopped challenging ourselves. And I think those are some of the key reasons why we can find ourselves in a funk in our career or even in our personal lives. And, and I know that firsthand very well. When you zoom out and now that you've described like what a funk is and maybe even some situations where we could think about that because some people are in a funk in multiple areas of their life. Could be career, could be family, could be their interests, their friendships, uh, could be one, could be all of the above. When you zoom out and your work, I know you coach people and you coach, coach organizations. What are some of the factors that lead up to someone getting in the funk? How do we get in this mess in the first place? Uh, that's a great question because I think we get in this monk, this funk in the first place is because at some point, Drew, I think we stopped being bold. And I'll give you an example of what I mean when we stop being bold in our lives. Um, in my book, I have a chapter where I talk about these two fashion designers. They were interviewed in the New York Times. And during the interview, they were talking about what it was like when they were creating their fashion label in the 1990s in New York City. And if anyone remembers or has read the New York newspaper stories, New York City back in the 1990s did not look like what New York City looks like now. And during that interview, at some point, one of the founders says, oh man, I miss the old New York. But then what his business partner did, he corrected him. And he said, you don't miss the old New York. What you miss is the old you, who you were during that time. So to answer your question, I think what a lot of people are missing right now, Drew, is who they once were during their youth, during those days of chasing things that truly mattered. An exercise I like to do with people sometimes is, I call it the best thing, exercise. And what I do is I ask people first to write down five things, five of the best things that ever happened to them. And typically what they do, Drew, is they'll write down five of the traditional things. They'll write down getting married, having kids, getting their degree, buying a home. All those things are great, right? But then I take that a next step and I say, okay, now tell me five of the best things to ever happen to you that are not traditional, that wouldn't show up uh, like getting married or having kids. And people really have to pause and really have to think. And that's the kind of the genesis of my podcast as well. And I'll give you a personal example for me. Some of the things that aren't traditional are the best things that ever happened to me. One was getting fired from my job at Nickelodeon. That's a whole other story, but that's one. A second one is moving to New York City with $800 in my bank account. A third one was walking on the track and field team. Another one is um, hosting a, a retreat in Nicaragua when I had no business hosting a treat in Nicaragua at the time. And then what you do is you think about those experiences, those best things, and you identify the emotions that you were feeling during that, right? Sometimes we were feeling nervous energy. We were feeling excitement. We were feeling challenged. And I think truly what we are missing, Drew, are those feelings. I think what we're truly chasing in life is a feeling. And a lot of people have stopped doing those things, those things that were considered bold. And they've gotten to, frankly, allow atrophy to set in. They've basically found themselves coasting on autopilot. You know, that's super important breakdown because I often think, you know, the next question that I that I think about as like an interview interviewer is 
what are some of the things or reasons that they stop chasing? Is it hurt? Is it getting let down? Is it things not working out? In your conversations with people, if they're not going for that, if they're not being bold, you know, people want to be bold. They want to feel good. They remember those situations and times where they felt good, but what's stopping them or why did they choose to slow down? Uh, one, as you imagined, uh, fear is one of the biggest things. The fear of things not working out. What happens if I put some energy and effort behind something and it doesn't work out? And one thing I always have to remind people is the question that we spend so much time and energy asking the question, what if it doesn't work out? Drew, it is so rare that we ask the question, what if it does work out? A lot of times we wonder, oh, you'll tell your friend a new idea about something you want to pursue. And then what do they still say? They say, well, you know, let's play devil's advocate, right? How come we don't have people in our lives who are saying, you know what, let's play God's advocate. Let's talk about this in a positive light, the positive things that can happen. So fear, of course, gets in the way. But I have to remind people that in many ways, and psychologists will tell you that fear and excitement are the exact same emotion. It depends on how you are looking at something. I love this quote from Fritz Perls. He founded uh, Gestalt Therapy. And he says, fear is excitement without the breath. And that statement in itself, when I learned that, changed my vantage point of how I was looking at fear or how I was looking at resistance, as uh, Stephen Pressfield talks about. A second thing I think that happens, Drew, that stops us from doing these things is, you're going to laugh at this, man, we accumulate too much stuff. We start accumulating so many things in our life. We end up getting a home with a mortgage. Of course, we got the car note. We buy all these different things. We get layered in so many different things that essentially we are a hoarder and we can't imagine even see what it would look like to break free from all of these responsibilities that we have. Again, when I think about the American dream, and this may be controversial, I look at the American dream and really in many ways is consumerism. It's trying to get us to buy stuff to do to fit into a life that it works for society, but we never ask the question, does this work for me? So I think we accumulate so much stuff literally and physically that that plays a major role. And then I think this is another one. And some of your listeners may may giggle at this a little bit, but at some point, Drew, we stop dreaming. We stop imagining what our future can look like. And we, we enter the quote unquote real world and we do what we have to do. But I'm a, it called me, I'm a, I'm a man in his 40s and I'm, I'm never going to stop dreaming. And I think we can always have the opportunity to rediscover and reimagine what things look like. You know, a question that I like to pose to people, this is a great, powerful coaching question. And I think people who hear this are going to, it's going to make them pause. And that question is this right here, as it relates to if you're no longer being bold. And that is, if your life was a movie up to this point, if your life was a movie, would you go see it? Drew, when I ask people that question, most folks will say, absolutely not. If my life was a movie up to this point, I probably would have walked out by now. Because it's so, um, I can I can anticipate what's going to happen next. It's boring. There's no adventure. There's no detours. And then I like to do the whole choose your own adventure, right? If your movie was halfway over, what would the lead character start doing or stop doing to start to turn things around? And that's when their brain starts to activate and they start to think about new ways, new decisions, things they can do, things they can stop doing that lets them start to dream again, that lets them start to imagine again. And to be clear, when I'm talking about dreaming and imagining, I'm not talking about quitting your job and moving to Bali to pursue something. I really believe that we can be happy where we are um, based on the decisions that we choose to make. Let's make it personal and talk about your own life. You had to share it earlier that you kind of found and part of the premise of your book is you talking about your own story. Um, I don't want to ruin the book and we obviously want to have you back on to talk about that once it's ready and out in January, 2021. But what can you share with the audience here? How can you relate to that story uh, in some way? Back in 2016, I had 100% stopped dreaming. Um, my marriage, my wife and I were married for just a year, Drew. And a lot of the stuff you probably know because, you know, of course, we're dear friends. Some stuff you may not know. A year into our marriage, man, we were, we were, we were thick, 
and marriage counseling. Things were not going good. We had twins that were born at 32 weeks that had to spend well over a month in the, the NICU, uh, getting stronger, being able to come home. At this exact same round, the same time, my father was diagnosed with dementia. And the man that I once knew that I could have a conversation with, that I could go to, to get, get feedback, uh, and just to learn from, I can no longer have those conversations with him. Uh, the irony, as I mentioned earlier, is that on paper, Drew, while I was experiencing all of this, everything looked great. If you said, look at the internet, Antonio was killing it. But inside, I was feeling horrible. And that led to me, Drew, sedating in the evenings. I would end pretty much almost every night at one point with a glass of wine or a cocktail, frankly, so I wouldn't feel. Drew, I gained nearly 30 pounds during that time frame from emotional eating because I was not getting you know, the emotions out. It got to the point where I was wearing a heart monitor because I thought I was going to have a heart attack at times because things were feeling so wrong internally. And this is one that you know I don't even really say outside a lot, but I do share in my book is I found myself, I knew things that really hit a quarter that I wasn't happy with, Drew, and I found myself regularly sneaking and smoking cigarettes in alleys. <laughs> I would wear a bright green gardening glove and smoke cigarettes in an alley. And I wore the glove so the smell didn't get on my hands. So when I spent time with you or I spent when I came home to see my wife, they wouldn't know that I was smoking. A funny story that really started to turn things around for me, Drew, during this time. By the way, I got to remind people on the internet right now, I was killing it, but inside I was dying. I remember one day I was smoking one of those cigarettes in a Santa Monica street alley and a homeless man came up and he was like, uh, saw me smoking. He's like, Hey man, can I bum a couple cigarettes? And I was like, yeah, no problem. This dude looked like he had seen many better days than this day. Gave him a couple of cigarettes. Then at some point he noticed the, the bright green glove I was wearing and he's like, yo, um, what's up with the glove, man? I was like, Oh, I'll wear this so uh, my, my wife doesn't know that I'm smoking and so she can't smell it. He looked at me, man, as if he felt so sorry for me and like as if his heart was broken looking at me. And then he said something, man, profound. He said, you got to figure that shit out, man. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am uh, allegedly killing it, you know, with my career in life. And this homeless man is looking at me with pain in his eyes saying, you got to figure that shit out. And that was one of those moments, Drew, that I had realized that, yo, I had stopped being bold. I had stopped dreaming that I was on cruise control and I had retreated from people that wanted to support me. I was doing good enough work as opposed to great work. And I was fortunate enough to have a community like you and to have going to therapy and different things to, you know, to slowly but surely, uh, course, correct my, my ship. But it did take time. You know, it does take time. And part of that time is the awareness that, again, going back to our early part of the conversation, which is even just knowing we're in a funk sometimes, especially with dealing with life situations, a parent who's sick, you know, kids being born premature, and it could be anything for anybody in this time period, getting let go, um, a family trauma, family sickness. There's can be so much going on that we're just trying to survive. So we don't even know if we're in a funk or not. So that was the circumstances and situation, but what do you think were a couple of the things that led to a real wake up call where it was like, whoa, like I can see this now from the outside. I can see my life from 30,000 feet up and wow, I'm in a funk. I need to do something about it. Was there something you read, a conversation? You know, there's always those little pivotal moments, moments that kind of help us make sense of everything and boom, we get it. Was there anything like that for you? Uh, it was a couple of things. One, it literally was that man telling me, that homeless man telling me I had to figure that shit out. And that hit me to my core, man. Like that, that was big. And I also think the day, Drew, that my wife found uh, the cigarettes um, in, <laughs> in the car and the hurt on her face. And when she kind of, the, the amazing thing about that moment, Drew, is that I was afraid that she was going to be so mad and angry at me. But when I shared with her what was going on and how stressed I was and what I was going through, she opened her arms to me. It was like, how can I help? And which was amazing because you can think about people who are going through tough times, maybe doing some things they're embarrassed of. And the people that they love, when they finally share with them, hey, I've been doing this behavior that's not the best. I've, I've done X, Y, or Z. 
we get hit with contempt. We get hit with judgment as opposed to open arms. Um, so those are a couple of things, but also what may uh, played a major role, um, of course, was you know the health diagnosis. Just knowing that if I continued not to take care of my body, things weren't going to look good. And I mm. got to say, being able, frankly, to go to our Man Morning event. I know you did an episode on this. Every Thursday, you know, we get together as men at, at seven o'clock in the morning. And being able to see folks and being able to communicate with them, even if I wasn't always sharing my full story, I walked away feeling better because I chose even during that time not to retreat from community. Um, and, you know, knowing y'all always had my back made a huge difference. And to get more more tactical, and, and I can share some specific things, Drew, that I think listeners could do to get out of a funk. Um, something else I did that really was germinating in my mind around that time was I started feeling bored, frankly, inside. Uh, you mentioned earlier that I spent over 10 years in the television industry. If there's one thing I love doing and one thing I'm great at, Drew, it's interviewing. It's having fascinating conversations with fascinating people. But my life had transitioned to me solely just speaking on stages to people, not with them. So I knew I had to do something to change that. And that led to me being willing to start that, that podcast, the best thing um, that even though it wasn't published until uh, 2020, that had been in my mind over the past couple of years. And hitting publish every week on that, Drew, has been a game changer for me, my happiness, that sense of accomplishment and the joy that I have conducting those interviews. You know, there's one super strong theme in what you just shared which is that when we're often in a funk, there's some element of hiding from the world. In your case, it was hiding this behavior and the cigarettes that you were using as a coping mechanism, or it could be the, the drinking component, right? There's some part of it that's hiding. Now that may be seen as a vice, but there's another side is where we're hiding our talents from the world. And we've had so many conversations and I always say, you know, when I started a podcast, I was like, Antonio, I can imagine you completely dominating in hosting a show because you're just a natural interviewer. You're a natural person, besides the fact that you actually have had professional training in it and have done it for, you know, much bigger opportunities that are out there. But you were also hiding that gift from the world, right? You were not intentionally, but you weren't moving forward with that aspect. So both on the vice side and on the talent side, one theme that seems to be there, I know anytime that I've been in a funk, it's the same thing for me, is we can hide some aspect of who we are or what potential we have with the world. Any thoughts on that? Absolutely. Um, for the longest time, and I came up in a day and age, I broke in the television industry prior to YouTube existing. Back when you had to have an agent, if you wanted to be on TV, you had to get hired via an agent, via a network, et cetera. So I came up with this mindset of I had to be endorsed by someone, by NBC, by Nickelodeon, by BET. And so I'd very rarely do anything to quote unquote endorse myself, if you will. Um, so my way of hiding over the years was I would, yeah, I'll hit record, I'll do some video, I'll do something, but there needs to be a sponsor. There needs to be a partner. And what I've learned, you know, doing this work and writing the book specifically is that it's so critical, Drew, for us to be willing to be our own benefactor, to be willing to endorse ourselves. Sometimes we, you know, as you mentioned earlier, I, I have self-published three books prior to, me, prior to me getting a big book deal with a major publishing house. I had self-published three books, but a lot of people have those questions inside of their brain. Like, what, what will people think about me if I self-publish a book? What will people think if I start this side hustle? What will people think if I decide to take that trip alone or if I decide to, you know, oh, join a church when no one else in my community is doing that? But we have to be willing sometimes to stand alone and endorse ourselves. And, you know, sometimes many people will tell you that you're going the wrong way. When indeed you're just going a way of your own. And when I talk about being your own benefactor, I like to think about great artists over the years. Look, Drew, we can talk about people like Mozart. We can talk about people like Picasso. We can talk about writers like Harper Lee. The one thing those men and women and plenty of other artists over the year had in common, you know what they have in common? Is that at some point they had benefactors. 
people who are willing to support their work. Well, now in this day and age, the game has changed and people could say, oh, it must be nice for them to have benefactors. What about me? Well, the good news is that with the right framing, we can have benefactors. Our jobs, the, the, that job that you may hate right now, that job that you may despise, which if hopefully no one's hating or despising a job right now with so many people being unemployed at this time, but the job that you potentially dislike, if you look at it through the right lens, could actually be your benefactor. A dear friend of mine, his name is Mitch Matthews. He said something to me that I'll never forget. He said, a dream job is a job that you absolutely love or a job that allows you to do what you love. In this day and age where we have all these amazing crowdfunding platforms, which they help you do great work, the GoFundMes of the world, the Kickstarters, the Indiegogos, et cetera, I think those are great, Drew, but at the same time, I think they have stopped people's ingenuity. They have stopped people being willing to invest in themselves. You know what? I'll do this project. I'll do this endeavor if I can raise money on this platform or if I can do this. But we have to be willing at some point to kickstart ourselves, right? I was joking at one point on my podcast in an introduction. I, I told the audience I, I was joking because you listen to so many podcasts nowadays and you hear people say, hey, before we get into the episode, I want to let you know this podcast is brought to you by XYZ sponsor, head over to blah, blah, blah. And I said, hey, I want you to let you know that this podcast is brought to you by, by me. I'm, <laughs> I'm paying for this out of my pocket. There is no sponsor. There is no one. So I invite all of you to be willing to invest in yourselves, to be your own benefactor. And since we're revealing as well, Drew, something I want to let people know is, you know, on the internet for a long time, I primarily put up a front at times letting people think that I primarily was making an income solely as a speaker, solely as a coach. What I didn't share behind the scenes is that at times during my speaking career, I've essentially held full-time jobs. At one point, I was working for About.me, a personal, the personal branding platform based out of San Francisco and commuting there pretty much every single week out of LA and along with my travel for speaking. Another time, uh, I basically had a full-time job working with Anata.io, the, the top e-commerce company for health and wellness brands, uh, as their narrative director. And I frankly wish I would have said that out loud more, Drew, that yes, I'm a coach. Yes, I speak on these stages across the country and sometimes internationally. And guess what? Sometimes I have a full-time job as well behind the scenes to handle my responsibilities. And I look at that and I celebrate because to me, it's like, wow, somebody's actually hustling and they care so much about what they creatively want to do and what direction they want to take their career that they're willing to do anything even if somebody's working you know five jobs whether somebody's delivering pizza working at a grocery store clerk like you know we all look at the movies and when we see that we feel inspired because it's like this person feels so committed to what they're doing they're willing to do whatever and i know you feel the same way too when you see that from the outside but i think it's important to ask why do you think that you were hiding it and not sharing it. Why did you not want that to be known? What did you think that you were getting in return by keeping it private? Uh, you know, it's the veneer, right? Uh, it's the veneer. You want everything on the outside of your home to look nice. You want to look perfect. You want to create this narrative that you're killing it and you're only making this money by doing this thing. And somehow by, you know, the thought in my head at the time was that if I shared that I had a full-time job, uh, that I wasn't as valuable, that I wasn't successful in the field and endeavor that I was pursuing. So at the time, it, it felt vulnerable. So for many, many years, man, I just put up a veneer. And the beautiful thing about that journey and about that man telling me I have to figure my shit out, Drew, was that what that started me on the path of doing was shedding that veneer, uh, that willingness to fully be seen all of the, the scars, the beauty, whatever I consider ugly, et cetera. I think many of us, we're, we're kind of like homes and you know they'll put a layer of paint on the outside and they'll keep painting and painting and painting. And we just have so many layers of paint on us. And that's sometimes when we end up with the fear. That's sometimes when we end up stuck. That's sometimes when we end up in the funk because we have so many layers. I call it the uniform. We wear this uniform for so long. 
And there's a powerful moment when we're willing to stop wearing the quote unquote uniform and get rid of all of those layers of paint, if you will, and get back to the true core of his, of the true essence of who we are. You know, I think in life in many ways, it can, it can be like a pendulum and we can go to extremes on both sides. I know I've gone to extremes of chaos and I've gone to extremes on the other side of things. And I think our job in many ways is to find ourselves back in the middle uh, our our true our, our true existence where we're supposed to be, and that's been uh, the journey for me. Um, and it's been um, not always easy, but <laughs> it's worth it. You know, you shared earlier about the concept of uh, benefactors and people supporting you and and helping you in your journey to not only pull you out of a funk, but to create an inspiring and passionate future that you can step into. Uh, anytime I talk about friendship, which I'm very passionate about, and I've done some episodes on this podcast. The number one question that I hear from people is, that's great for you, and I'm happy that you have this men's group that meets every Thursday, that supports each other, and that you guys are connected, and that you have somebody to talk to, but I don't have anybody like that in my life. In fact, not only do I have no one, I've been let down by people. With any For anybody who has that history and that baggage, and I mean that in a kind way, right? That's that past history, past experiences, and they don't feel like they have that community. How do they begin to start to recreate it? That's a great question. It makes me think about when I was an undergraduate at Western Michigan University, Drew, I, I tried out for the track and field team and I ended up earning a spot on the roster and I was what you call a walk-on. And the thing is that after two years of being on the team, I was doing absolutely horrible. And one day my head coach came up to me and he said, you're doing absolutely horrible, but I already knew, but he pointed something out to me. And he said, I don't know if you know this, Tony, which, which, you know, which, which folks, family, family and friends call me. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but we have two all Americans on our team. And he pointed to these two men working out drew and these cats, one would go on to compete in the Olympics and another one would go on to compete in multiple world championships, two of the best athletes in the world. He said, we have two All-Americans on our team, but not once have I seen you spend any time with them. And he said, instead, you're hanging out with those guys. And he pointed to a group of guys laying back, laughing on the high jump mat. They didn't commit any crimes, didn't do anything wrong, but I was hanging out with those folks as opposed to the All-Americans. And what Coach Shaw really opened me up to that, that day was this idea of having the opportunity to spend time with allies, those All-Americans, or thieves, those people that aren't going to be for us, aren't going to have our best interest. So for that man or woman who says, I don't have that, I got to say that at the end of the day, 100% is our responsibility uh, to find these men and women to be in our lives. And we're going to have to be vulnerable to do that. One thing we have to remember when it comes to identifying these allies in our life is that these men and women, they may not be our best friends. There may not be people we talk to every single day, but the critical thing is that we have these positive men and women in our life. And so I invite you to think about the five people you spend the most time with and ask yourself this simple question, do they make you better? Do the five people you spend the most time with, do they make you better or not? And if they don't, I ask you to start identifying those folks that can make you better, to get out a piece of paper and say, in my family, who are those men and women in my family that I know I can reach out to who will be there, who are positive, that will have my back? Write those folks down. I invite you to think about your community and your friends. And once again, identify those folks you can reach out to who you know will be a positive inspiration, even if they're not best friends in your life every single day. I ask you to think about your colleagues. Right now, there are some amazing men and women at your jobs that would create and add awesome value to your life. And you can identify them, but you have to be willing to ask for that support. And we can go on and on. We can think about people in our community. We can think about people in our church. We can think about great meetup groups that exist, whether they're in person or virtual. Here's what I've come to learn in my life, Drew, and I know you believe this as well, is that nine times out of 10 people, not only are they willing to help you, but they want to help you. And, and this is a very big and, and they can't help you if they don't know you need help. That was one of the biggest challenges I had in my life is being willing to ask for help, being willing to say I am lost, being willing to say 
I don't know the next step. Will you help me? And we're always afraid of being judged. But most times, man, people will say absolutely. And if they can't help you, they will point you in the right direction. So indeed, it's going to be vulnerable. Some people are going to let you down. But I invite you still to keep moving forward, knowing you're just one step closer to finding that person as you continue to knock on doors and be clear with your asks. Yeah. And I would add to that. It's like, if that's not your family, that's okay. That can be a whole other group of people. If that's not the same friends that are the friends that you had in high school or in college because they have different priorities, that's okay. But don't shut it down before you go to a new group of people. There's actually something really interesting and it's documented as a phenomenon. My friend Michael Simmons has written about it in Forbes is that our lukewarm contacts, the people that are in our lives, I mean, that's how we started off getting to know each other, Antonio, is that we weren't really super close friends. And then we met through another mutual friend. And then through that process, hung out a couple of times, had some good conversations, you know, introduced each other to each other's friends and realized like, wow, you both have, we both realized that each other had something interesting to offer. So we became advocates. And sometimes it's the person that you don't know super well that has a whole history and baggage of here's Antonio, here's what he's good at, here's what he's not good at. No, he wouldn't be good for that opportunity. No, he shouldn't write a book. That tends to come with people that have known you throughout your life for good or for worse. They don't often see you in the direction of where you want to go. So, so sometimes when people hear that advice that you were just sharing, they're like, okay, great. I did that. And I was shut down. It's like, okay, but maybe it's not that group. Maybe it's a different group of people that help you get to the next level. I I agree 100%. And you put that eloquently and I'll add that some, you're going to find that sometimes the people that help you the most know you the least, which has always blown me away. It's frustrated me, but I've released it as well. And you're also going to find, this is the challenging one right here, Drew, is that sometimes as you grow, it can cause tension with other folks in your life. I found that sometimes it actually can threaten people when you grow. Why? Because many times your growth, you're making new decisions, you're doing positive things, is holding up a mirror to others. Many folks that are close to you, it holds up a mirror to what they are not doing in their lives. In many ways, though they can't articulate it, they feel like they are being left behind. But once again, just because you're going your own way doesn't mean it's the wrong way. And one other thing I want to add, Drew, regarding relationships is, and this is what's great about our men's group and most of my really positive friendships, is that we have to be willing to get what I like to call good friction. And that's the accountability piece of things. Uh, Because I have a great story. When I was in grad school at Columbia University, my master's advisor was a Pulitzer Prize winning author. I mean, come on, the best of the best. And I remember, Drew, being so hesitant to turn in drafts of my master's thesis to him. And the reason why I was hesitant, Drew, is because I knew it would come back covered in red ink and I'd have to do so much work. And I feel like at times I'd have to start from scratch. And one day he saw that I was hesitant to submit and to get this feedback. And he asked me point blank, like, yo, why aren't you submitting this on time? And I said, because of all the red ink that's going to be on it. He looked at me and he smiled and he said, don't you know you pay for the red ink. Mm, Like you pay for the red ink. And so my thing is this, good allies are going to provide what I call good friction. And again, I say good friction. I'm talking about something that's being constructive. Drew, you've given me awesome feedback on things many times, different projects, different endeavors, sometimes maybe not always the easiest things to hear. But what's been awesome and consistent about your feedback is that I call it good friction because it's propelling me forward in what I want to do, as opposed to propelling me backwards. You know, I think there's a big distinction we have to do is like, we seem, some people seem to take pride in this whole notion, oh, I'm going to call him out. I'm going to call her out. I invite you to instead call someone up. There's a big difference for a manager or a leader to call someone out versus call them up to propel them forward to be better, not just today, but tomorrow as well. Super powerful. And I couldn't agree more. You know, so much of this comes back to the fact, especially as we get older and kids enter into the picture and our lives and our routine changes, even starting with the notion of like, do you have friends that you can go to 
and share your goals and dreams with who are excited about it. Mm. And the next question they're asking is, what can they do for you? And how can they support you? I find, and you know, Dr. Vivek Murthy, who was the former uh, commissioner of the FDA, is a good friend of my business partner, Dr. Hyman. He was recently on his podcast because he wrote a book about loneliness and how chronic loneliness, super chronic loneliness can be the equivalent up to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That's how much of a toll it can take on our health. And pre-coronavirus and the shutdown, I think that life was just getting so busy for so many people with the day-to-day rat race that many individuals were in, naturally so, just trying to do their best and keep up with the activities of themselves, their partner, their kids, that even the idea of developing new friendships from scratch, finding people that would lift us up, a lot of people would feel like, I don't have time for that. Like, where am I going to go meet people? And so it'd get placed on the back burner. And I think the silver lining of this time period here is with things slowing down, we can all ask ourselves individually, what matters the most to us? What do we want to take that's the good side of what's happened so far and keep bringing into our world as the economy and the world starts to open up? I I agree. And as you're saying that, what's what's popping up in my brain for folks is this notion we talked about dreaming earlier, Drew. Uh, And during this time, it's so important to remember that, and at all times, it's important to remember that your dreams need encouragement. They need to see you making those positive steps, making that forward momentum, creating your own momentum to create good things to happen. I truly believe, and a lot of people don't like to hear this when I share this on stages, Drew, but I think we have to be honest with ourselves. I believe that all of our dreams have an expiration date. All those things that we say we're going to do one day, that when things change, our dreams have an expiration date if we don't act on them. One of the great things about, like you said, about having great people in your life is they help you create that forward momentum. You know, people will say, I hear what he's saying, but you know what, man, it's never too late. But I'll tell you this, it's never too late, but the longer you wait, the harder it gets. And other people will say, oh man, I I hear you, but maybe it just wasn't meant to be. And I say to that, was it just not meant to be or did you give up? And that's kind of the, the, you know, the, the call, I call that calling up to people to encourage them, to remind them that they have a say in their life. And that's what happened to me. At some point, Drew, I forgot that I had a say in my life. And if there's a a thesis of the work that I'm going to do, not just today, but moving forward, it is to remind people that they have a say in their life in the direction they can go moving forward. Mm, Powerful, my friend, powerful. So I want to talk about one other component here, which is when we catch ourselves in a funk and there's this realization and we have the intention to want to do it differently, approach life differently. Where does the physical body come into play? Was there anything that you were doing different? Because we know that so much energy and just even like sometimes when people say, I'm stuck, I feel stale, that we know we're often not moving our body. But for you and for the people you've coached, where does the physical body come into play uh, between our diet, lifestyle, movement? Uh, We'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Physical is huge. As I mentioned, I was a collegiate athlete. Uh, movement has always been a huge part of my life. When I was going through, I'll call it my uh, <laughs> my, my, my crisis, uh, as I mentioned, I, I'd gained 30 pounds. Uh, I had stopped working out. I had grew a big beard in an attempt to hide that 30 pound weight gain, which by the way, it didn't hide it at all. Um, once I started to make some forward progress, what that looked like was regularly working out and sweating going to the gym, et cetera. And I, I have a list of five things I do every single day and I, and I check them off on my list. And one of those is sweat. It doesn't, need a need, doesn't mean that I have to run a marathon, but I want to get in at least minimum 20 minutes of movement. And I've been fortunate enough to be able to do that consistently even now through the pandemic, even though it means getting up at 5 a.m. before my kids get up to do that. So movement and sweating is critical. Uh, second part of that, of course, is is meditation. Uh, meditation doesn't come easy for me, but I know for a fact when I get that in every single day, even if it's just for a matter of 10 minutes, it's a game changer for me. Uh, as really, I, I consider that movement in some ways. It's like our friend Light Watkins calls the 
the inner gym. The third thing, of course, and uh, your listeners are going to know this already, it, it's being careful what we're putting in our body and what we're eating. I'm no expert on that, but I am smart enough now to know what's going to fuel me and what's going to deplenish me. And that's a question I always ask myself before I make a choice to eat something. Is this going to fuel me or is this going to deplenish me? Uh, a fourth piece that I'll share on that, Drew, and this is a unique one when it comes to movement. I like to equate it to shifting gears in a car. And a lot of times I think we are like kind of automatic vehicles but that are have five gears, but for some reason we get stuck only driving in one of those gears. Typically it's second or third gear where you can't go too fast. And I don't believe we were meant to stay in just one gear. One of the key things that helped me make an overall shift, not just physically, but energetically, Drew, was being willing to make an investment in myself on two fronts. One, working with a therapist, which, you know, many years ago, I wouldn't have said that out loud, but that's made a huge difference for me individually. It's made a difference for my marriage and beyond. Uh, the second thing is being willing to invest in a coach uh, that I've worked with over the years. Uh, I'm a firm believer of something that I think most people are, and that's this. No one who has accomplished, no one who has accomplished anything of significance did it alone, and neither should you. And I feel like sometimes we're trying to solve our own problems on our own. But when we, again, whether we have that group of allies, whether we're working with a therapist or we're working with a coach, it can make a huge difference. And the irony, Drew, was that I'm a coach. And for the longest time, I didn't have my own coach. So once again, obviously that sweating, that meditation, uh, the eating, and being willing to seek that outside support, I think plays a huge role in the physicality of things. You know, uh, you introduced me to one of your friends who I'd heard about for a while because I read his uh, ebook, and we'll, we'll be doing a podcast with him too on Broken Brain, Bassam, and he wrote a book called The Accountability Effect. And one of the things that we talk about in the interview and one of the key takeaways of the book is that, you know, at the end of the day, this privileged life, because if you're listening to this podcast, if you have a computer, if you have a cell phone, if you live in, you know, we have listeners from all over the world, but if you live in a country that has means and access and you're not in a war zone or trying to figure out what your next meal is going to come from, there's some version of privilege that's there that you have access to. It's a scale. Some people have it more, some people have it a lot less, but there's some version of privilege you have access to. So if you have the capability and the access to this. And the next question becomes, what are you going to do with it? And sometimes we see our success as oh, you know, I'm not good enough or I'm not as successful as these other people and I need to do more in life. And it's from a place of like, I'm behind. I need to do more. But Bassam inside of the book is basically an interesting concept which says, you know, you owe it to the world. And when I listen to your content and our conversations, Antonio, I see part of what you're talking about and sharing with people is that this is not just about getting out of a funk. This is about getting out of a funk because somebody's counting on you. Somebody out there needs your work, needs your gift that you are born to bring to them. Can you talk about that? Yeah. First, Basam Tarazi and his work is, is amazing. Uh, I've been following him. He's been a friend for a long time, and I'm glad he's on the podcast. Look, Drew, I believe that there can be three dates on a tombstone. It can be day, the day you born, the day you gave up, and the day you died. The day you were born, the day you gave up, and the day you died. I look at life in many ways kind of like Las Vegas with all the quote-unquote privilege we have. Again, if we have those things that you just articulated. And I just want your listeners to imagine that they're in Las Vegas and, and they walk into a casino and they go past the blackjack tables and the roulette tables and poker and they find themselves in the sports book area. The sports book area is where people bet on sporting events, baseball, football, boxing, horse races, you name it. Now imagine if you look up at the, the digital board where all the odds are and what the things are you can bet on. And imagine if you looked up there and your name was up there and people were betting on you. The question begs, would you allow people to bet on you. I believe our goal, our mission every single day is to be willing to do things to not only to get others to bet, in our, to bet on us, 
but most importantly, to get ourselves to regularly bet on ourselves every single day. You know, we talk a lot about the word commitment. You got to commit. You got to commit. One thing we don't talk enough about, Drew, is recommit. Because after you make the commitment, that's easy. But you have to recommit every single day to what is most important. I like to think about it in terms of the last 30 days. I like to ask people sometimes on stage, just think about your last 30 days at work. And based on those last 30 days at work, if your boss had to make a decision to rehire you, would they immediately say yes? That, and let me tell you something, Drew, when I ask that question on stages, there's a lot of laughter, uncomfortable laughter. Then I shift that question to now, if you happen to be married or in a relationship, think about the last 30 days of your marriage or relationship. If your partner had to make a decision to recommit to you based on those last 30 days, would they immediately say yes? That's when a lot of uncomfortable laughter happens or people start looking down or they don't want to make eye contact with me. We can also ask that question as a parent, based on your last 30 days as a parent. Would your kid immediately want you as mom or dad or has your phone been between you and them for too long? Or have you said, give me five more minutes, I'll be right with you. That for me is what accountability is all about. Not only being willing to regularly bet on ourselves, but knowing that those people in our lives that matter most to us still want us there because we're holding up our end of the bargain. Drew, last year I was traveling to an event in Virginia and I found myself on a plane and I remember smelling fumes in the plane, Drew. And I, as much as I fly, I knew something wasn't right. And that was confirmed when I saw the flight attendant on this small plane that was obviously panicked. And she started reading from this book, How to Brace uh, for a Possible Crash. And the pilot on the plane said these words I will never forget, Drew. We are going to attempt an emergency landing. And I had this moment, Drew, when I was like, ain't this some shit? And I was, of course, afraid, but also there was a, a laughing moment inside of me of ain't this some shit. And I wrote a short text message to my mom and to my wife. And once we got low enough on that plane, or excuse me, low enough altitude where the bar showed up, I hit send. And I was resigned to the fact that this may be the end of things for me. Obviously, you and I, are talking. So we landed okay, surrounded by fire trucks and all these different things. And I'm okay. But what I'm the point I'm trying to get across in the story is don't wait for a life altering event for you to change your life. I want to remind people and I have to remind myself every single day that you, that I am that life altering event. And I don't want for that car accident to happen to you, for you to lose someone you love. No, make that decision today to be that life-altering event that is you. Mm. Important message to close on, Antonio. I super appreciate you coming on the podcast, talking about the lessons that are basically a sneak peek into the upcoming book that are coming out. So that feels really exciting to get access to that and to share your journey and story with us. I think that you're a fantastic storyteller and uh, you've had so much practice speaking. And I think ultimately at the end of the day, we all just need reminders. There's nothing in this podcast that people are hearing for the first time. There's nothing in any of my podcast for the most part that people are hearing for the first time. It's that we resonate with it and it's a reminder because we step into the story and you so vulnerably shared about your story for our listeners and for myself to step into. Talk about how people can keep in touch with you. Talk about some of the projects and the work and the book and the podcast that you have out there so our listeners uh, can continue the journey and the conversation. Sure, Drew. Thank you so much for having me. For those folks that want to learn more about me, you can head to theantonionevs.com. I have some awesome reports you can download for free there. Whether it's on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, I'm at the Antonio Neves. And of course, I would love for you to give a listen to the Best Thing podcast where I talk to people about the best thing that ever happened to them that would rarely show up on a resume, a bio, or come up in conversation. Check out my, my interview with Drew. And those are the key things you can do right now. I'd love to hear from you with any questions. I pretty much respond to every email. It may take 72 hours, but I still pretty much respond to 
every email. And, and Drew, I can't thank you enough, A, for creating this awesome podcast and for, for having me on today. It was a pleasure. One more follow-up question for you. You know, I posted this Miles Davis quote a few uh, days ago or weeks ago on Instagram. Um, and it was this famous quote. And he says, man, sometimes it takes you a long time to sound like yourself. I'm curious for you, how has it been getting back in the interview seat? And what have you learned from doing these interviews on your podcast? One, it's been absolutely amazing. It is like a muscle that atrophy had said in. It's a muscle, something that I love, that I'm great at. And having these conversations with these fascinating men and women has been such a joy. Uh, the biggest learning versus me being the broadcaster uh, versus me being the podcast host now is I feel like I'm truly me. You can hear my voice. You can hear a little bit of my, my twang. You can hear me maybe even swear every now and then, things I wouldn't have done years ago. I think we all know you watch the, the guy or the woman on television or heard them on radio talking like this. Hey, welcome to a brand new episode. No one talks like that in real life. Yeah. And I and I had that voice for the longest time, Drew. And for me, it's just I, I all I want to do, man, is to be me. And you know what? And the reason why I just want to be me is because that other stuff is so exhausting. People always talk about, oh, just be yourself. And it's one of the hardest things, frankly, you can you can do. It takes a little, maybe some time and a journey to do it. But let me tell you something, man. I feel freer than I've ever felt before in my life doing this podcast, and I'm not going to stop. Be you, because that's all you can be, and the world is counting on you. Yeah. Antonio, thanks again for joining us on the Broken Brain Podcast. Thank you.